today. Great.com talks with Jenna Gilbert, who is the director of Refugee at Human Rights First. If you haven't heard of them, they are a non-profit organization who focuses not on making a point, but on making a difference. If you are new here, please press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because today we learn why we should stand together for human rights. Hello, Jenna, and welcome to our podcast. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. And thank you for being here. And I really look forward to this conversation today. So for me and anybody new here, what is Human Rights First and what do you do? So Human Rights First is a nonprofit organization based in the United States. Uh, we focus on advocacy and action to um to basically advocate on on behalf of human rights issues. Um, As you mentioned, my role is as director of the Refugee Representation Program. And in that role, um, I lead our organization's pro bono refugee um, work. Basically, we partner with large law firms around the United States to provide free legal assistance to asylum seekers or refugees um, here in the United States. Um, And our three offices are in New York, uh, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. So we primarily focus on Um, asylum seekers living in those areas. Yeah, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. And so you you focus on helping the asylum seekers, etc. So the next question for me would be, what does the word freedom mean to you? And why is this important? Oh, so I think that the word freedom to me means the ability to live one's life uh, according to their own beliefs, their own values, um, their own their own moral compass, um, and not imposing uh, the government's view or the government's belief on people. I think that's important, especially in the asylum context, given that that's the work that I do, because we oftentimes represent individuals who are fleeing their home country because their governments or individuals have have tried to dampen that freedom, right? They've tried to uh, take away one's ability to uh, freely exercise their political opinions or um, practice their their religious beliefs um, or, you know, express their gender um, expression or sexual orientation. Um, And so that's really the, the fundamental basis of what we do here is we try to allow people the protection that they need in order to 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 be their true selves and um and practice their own beliefs and opinions yeah and thank you jenna for sharing that with us and i really liked your opinion there and your thoughts on what freedom means so it's quite hard to hear that say people obviously need to seek asylum because they are almost being kicked out of their own countries due to different things like beliefs and religions, etc. So what would you say is the main thing that needs to happen to sort of help stop this at the moment? Well, I mean, let's be real. Uh, even in the United States, we have plenty of issues ourselves and people face persecution on, on you know, uh, on a, a daily basis, um, whether it be because of the color of their skin or that they, you know, live in, a, in an area that is historically marginalized. So it's certainly not that the United States is is a perfect example of, of one living in freedom, right? I think that around the world we have, uh, and, and the whole reason behind behind the the concept of a refugee, you know, all of this came about as a result of World War II, and what we saw happening um, uh, primarily to to Jewish people um, within um, areas controlled by the Nazis, right? So, I mean, I think over 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 time, historically, we've seen that anytime there's some sort of um, um, conflict, any sort of um, uh, um, political regime that comes into play that does not respect individual rights, that that people end up having to flee, right? And um, thankfully, the Refugee Convention allows for a framework for individuals to come to countries where the Refugee Convention is implemented and people can seek asylum there and, and seek protection that they need in times of crisis. 
I think in an ideal world, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need that framework, but unfortunately we live in the world that we do and there will never be any short shortage of crises or political conflicts, um, that will, um, uh, negate the need for, for refugee protection around the world. Yeah. And again, thank you so much for sharing that with us because but I, I personally think that as long as, say, you're not hurting or harming anybody, everyone is entitled to freedom and should be able to live their life on their terms and conditions. So going on from that, since his founding in 1978, what have been some of your greatest challenges and how did you overcome them? So I have been with you and it's first for the past eight years. So I'll speak, I'll speak in, in more recent terms in the last eight years. Um, but, you know, I think that some of the greatest challenges probably occurred during the last administration, presidential administration here in the United States um, during the Trump administration. Um, during that four-year period, we saw an attempt to really decimate the asylum system as we know it. Um, we are still trying to, to rebuild uh, from the damage that was caused over the last four years. Um, and it's been, unfortunately, a, a rather painstakingly slow process. I think that a lot of advocates such as myself have felt that this administration has not taken the steps that they need to take as quickly as they need to take it to restore asylum and to really welcome people here in the United States with dignity. Um, so I would say that over the last um, four years, some of the biggest challenges have included really an assault on individuals who are fleeing domestic violence situations in different countries around the world specifically targeting individuals fleeing domestic violence uh, from the Northern Triangle of Central America. So Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. We've really seen that that administration um, took a hardline approach and essentially was trying to wholesale block individuals fleeing Central America from, from seeking asylum in the United States. And that was a um, really difficult challenge, both for, for us as an organization, for me personally as an immigration lawyer, um, but most importantly for our clients, um, a lot of whom have fled really horrific situations of violence um, where their home countries were just simply unable or unwilling to provide them with any meaningful source of, of protection. So I would say that that's been probably one of the most um, significant challenges. Fortunately, uh, last week, actually, the Attorney General of the United States um, issued a decision rescinding some of those horrific um, policies, um, which is a great step forward, um, but it's certainly not enough to make people whole and undo the damage that was done over the past four years. But some of the, the greatest um, achievements, I think, are really you know, while we as an organization advocate on behalf of asylum seekers as a whole, in my opinion, some of the greatest achievements have been on those individual cases. So, you know, every time that you are successful in a client, in an individual client's asylum case, you know, not only are, is it personally very gratifying because you've been working with this person for such a long time, you know, the really the worst things that have ever happened to them. Oftentimes they're the first, you're the first person that they've ever shared their complete story to. Um, and so there's a, a really deep and fundamental level of trust built between, between attorney and client in that relationship. And when you're finally able to see them through the process, which in the United States can sometimes take years, it's, it's incredible. Um, we recently won asylum for a transgender woman from Kuwait, um, who I represented before the asylum office. And after the interview, we didn't yet have the decision. Uh, it took another two months to get the decision. But after the interview, she felt so relieved and happy. And this is someone who had been in the process since 2015 um, that she put her mom on speakerphone and, and put me on the phone with her mom back in back in Kuwait and was just, you know, pouring out her love and, and thanks for for helping her daughter. And, you know, that was a really meaningful, meaningful experience. I've been in this field for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the more than a, more than a decade. And those, those stories of joy and, and, and overcoming um, the odds to, to secure asylum really never, never get old. And, and, and those are always, in my opinion, the biggest achievements. Wow. That's, that's so nice to hear that you can help people in that way as in like so sort of one-on-one -on -one almost and you say that she facetimed her mum as well like it's so nice and 
the gratitude that's there as well. So in terms of numbers, do you have like a rough um, estimate of numbers of people, how many people you've managed to help, say, over the year or each year on average at all? Yeah, so our organization in our three offices currently represents over 1,200 individuals and families seeking asylum. Um, and so that number, you know, tends to stay more or less um, uh, the same. So as we win cases, we take on new cases. Um, you know, so over the years, we've we've certainly helped thousands of asylum seekers um, to obtain to obtain asylum here in the United States. So it's it's. Um, you know, as you said, it's a it's a one on one uh, help. But you know, our organization's program has been operational for the past forty years, and so we've been able to help thousands of individuals secure asylum and and ultimately reunite with their families here in the United States. Yeah, wow, that's absolutely incredible to hear that you can help that many people on that sort of scale as well. So yes, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to hear. So also, I just wanted to ask, sort of what impact has the COVID situation have or had on the people that you support? So um, it has been quite challenging for most of our clients. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we're a nonprofit organization. And so we only help individuals who are unable to, to afford private um, counsel in their immigration cases. So, you know, our clients come from uh, low income backgrounds, um, <clears throat> oftentimes they don't have the resources that might be available to, to someone of more means or to a U.S. citizen. So it's been a real challenge. Um, we have the great fortune of having a social worker in our Los Angeles office who has worked very closely with our clients over the past year and a half during COVID to, to check in on them, to address some of their basic needs. We've had a number of really critical partnerships with other organizations, one of whom is called Family to Family. Um, and basically they provide um, uh, gift cards to our clients um, really to just buy food to put on the table. And it's, you know, it's not a huge amount, it's $50 a month, but that $50 a month can, can sometimes be the difference between having a nourishing meal and going without. So it has been a tremendously difficult period for our clients, um, but we've also seen an extraordinary amount of support from community-based organizations, um, from individuals, from other nonprofits to really come together to help pr provide for, for folks' basic needs, such as food, housing assistance, and the like during COVID. You can also probably imagine that with most of our clients being um, low income, many of them also work in the service industry. And so, um, you know, that that industry has been particularly hard hit by COVID and people have lost their jobs uh, and and really just had had quite a difficult time um, around this time last year. Um, uh, we noticed that an alarming number of our clients were actually um, contracting COVID-19. And, and again, that has a lot to do with the fact that people are living, you know, multi-generational um, families in tight quarters, in low-income neighborhoods, um, you know, and working in, in as essential workers in, in service industries and in healthcare. So um, it's made a big difference um, uh, and, and really had a significant impact on our clients. One thing that has been um, something of a silver lining is that, you know, we shifted our model of representation to to um, to allow for remote representation. So if, if you can tell, I'm in my home, I'm in my apartment, I'm not in an office. We're still not working um, in an office uh, within our organization and everyone's working from home. But what that has meant is that we've been able to connect with our clients via Zoom, video conference, uh, phone, much more than we would have in pre-pandemic times. And while that presents its own level of challenges, especially for clients who do not have access to a technology um, and other issues, it's eliminated some of the barriers that our clients face in accessing representation. So they no longer have to worry about, you know, child care to take care of their child while they while they come to our office or go to an immigration court. They don't have to worry about um, accessing public transportation, which during these times has been particularly, um, uh, you know, dangerous. 
they can do things, you know, they don't have to take off work. They, they can kind of meet with their attorneys in a more flexible way. Um, and so I think that in some ways this has helped um, lessen some of the, um, uh, the barriers that many of our clients may have faced in accessing um, counsel. Mm, yes. And from what you said there, it sounds like you managed to take a positive from, say, a negative situation. And I personally believe that there is always a positive that you can extract from a negative situation. So as hard as the COVID situation has been, there are obviously the positives that you've managed to take from that. So sort of another question as well that I wanted to ask was, what are, say, some of the biggest needs of those individuals and communities that you support? And how are you part of the solution? As in, how does it go from, say, the, the individual's need to, to your, um, say, support or help? How, how, does it, how does it work? How does someone, say, reach out to you guys? And then how do you offer them that, that support there? Yeah. So obviously our organization primarily focuses on the legal needs of individuals seeking asylum. So um, one of the, the most common ways that people find us is because the U.S. government actually publishes lists of um, uh, free legal service providers that are available in each of the cities where there's an immigration court. So many of our clients reach out to us through that list, um, as well as through community referrals from other organizations, um, referrals from existing and former clients. Um, and sometimes people just, you know, are, are very, um, um, you know, adept at, at uh, doing some online research and find us on their own through through that mechanism. So that's the primary way that that people end up reaching out to us. Um, and in terms of you know the the how we address the needs. So again, we um, uh, identify the individuals that are in need of asylum representation. We do a full screening with those people, uh, and if we accept a case into our program, as I mentioned at the outset, um, the majority of our cases are actually placed with pro bono. Uh, attorneys at large law firms throughout the country. So those lawyers tend to have no prior immigration experience or asylum experience, but we identify those individuals who want to help, who want to contribute um, outside of their day job. And we provide them with training and mentorship and guidance throughout the process so that ultimately we are able to make sure that they provide high quality legal assistance to, to our clients. So it ends up being a multiplier effect. So I, as an individual attorney, might only be able to handle a small amount of cases in any given calendar year. I'm able to mentor many, many, many more attorneys uh, to do that work. And I help them through the process. So ultimately we're able to serve more individuals and attorneys are able to give back and use their legal skills and training um, in a different way um, outside of, 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 you know, the work that they may do as, as a corporate lawyer um, at a large firm. So that's the primary way that we assist with our clients in terms of their of their legal needs. But we recognize that our clients, um, again, are people who have usually um, suffered extraordinary trauma um, and difficulties in their home country, extraordinary trauma in the process of actually coming to the United States and seeking asylum. And so we do have a social worker on staff who helps work with our clients to provide assistance with their psychosocial needs. So whether that be uh, linking them up with a mental health provider or um, assisting them in signing up for um, uh, the benefits that they're eligible for, or providing them with uh, information for a local food bank, whatever the need is, we try to address those needs because ultimately if those needs go unaddressed, that becomes a barrier to uh, providing legal representation. If someone doesn't have food on the table or they don't have um, you know, a, mean of, a means of transportation to get to an immigration hearing, they're less likely to meaningfully participate in their immigration case. Yeah, wow. And so with that being said, what is your vision for the future? Uh, well, I think there are some really interesting um, social justice movements going on in the immigration sphere. I think that it would be 
um, my hope that in the future we will get to a situation where individuals don't need to either pay for a lawyer or, you know, happen to find one of the nonprofits that that has some capacity to represent them in their immigration court hearings, but instead that the government actually provides a uh, government appointed counsel for individuals, essentially working myself out of a job, right? Um, because ultimately these are incredibly um, uh, complex and difficult proceedings. Um, and uh, it's simply not acceptable to have individuals trying to either represent themselves or, or, or managing to find the good fortune of, of getting a lawyer for free. Um, these are have been historically um, uh, characterized by uh, an immigration judge as uh, death penalty cases in a traffic court setting. So the, the, the consequences could not be more serious. Um, and we really need to provide people with, with competent legal representation to help them navigate that process. Yeah. And again, thank you so much for sharing that with us. So for anybody say listening, what can somebody do to help and what action steps can they take to be part of the solution? So um, obviously, I, I work. I work with lawyers, and I'm a lawyer myself. So if you find yourself uh, as a lawyer wanting to give back, certainly reaching out to our organization, Human Rights First uh, uh, org is our website, and you can reach out to us to see about um, possibly taking on a pro bono asylum case. Um, if you're not a lawyer, uh, there are other means to give back. As I mentioned, we have robust partnerships with individuals and organizations and community groups. Um, um, to provide um, assistance on uh, in our psychosocial needs of our clients, including a client emergency fund uh, that we accept donations for. Through that fund, we do things like provide assistance for um, you know rental relief uh, for if individuals that are potentially facing eviction or need to to find housing. We also provide again um, food assistance um, and and other and other emergency needs of our clients. Um, so that's also a great way. Um, but, you know, if you have a specific skill set, a specific connection, uh, something that you think would be meaningful to an asylum seeker's life, uh, you know, certainly you can reach out to our organization and we can um, try to figure out a partnership that would make sense. Wow, Jenna, thank you so much. And thank for you, you listening, yeah, thank you, Jenna. And for you listening, if you've enjoyed this episode, please press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app. That will show the algorithms that this is an important conversation so more people can learn why it is important for America to live up to its ideals.